Hello, and welcome to another episode of Boundless Body Radio. I'm your host, Casey Ruff, and today we have another amazing guest to introduce to you now. Dr. Chris Kenobi is an ophthalmologist and Associate Clinical Professor Emeritus, formerly of the University of Texas Southwestern Medical Center. Dr. Kenobi is a world-renowned expert in the field of nutrition and chronic disease, but is most well-known for his work with the disorder known as age-related macular degeneration. He is the author of the book, Ancestral Dietary Strategy to Prevent and Treat Macular Degeneration, which he wrote in 2016. He is the founder and president of Cure AMD Foundation, a nonprofit organization dedicated to the prevention of vision from AMD. I met Dr. Kenobi at Low Carb Denver 2020, which was a year ago this week uh, at the time of this recording, and heard his presentation about the horrible impacts of omega seed, uh, omega-6 seed oils as a major driver of chronic disease, including AMD, and absolutely just rocked me. It was such a great talk, and I was able to meet him and talk to him there, and we are thrilled and honored to have Dr. Chris Kenobi on our show. Welcome to Boundless Body Radio. Thank you, Casey. It's uh, it's a pleasure and an honor to be on your show. I appreciate it very much. We're so grateful for you and your time to, to um, appear on the show, which is great. That was the most technical um, intro I've ever done. I had to practice it 87 times and still goofed a bunch of stuff up. There's a lot of big words involved with what you do. <laughs> Well, you did it a lot better than I could have done it. <laughs> well, that's so interesting. So I just <laughs> mentioned your talk at Low Carb Denver, and I just assumed, like, wow, this guy is an absolute natural at public speaking. But when you got to talking, I learned that you had to learn the art of public speaking relatively recently. Is that correct? I uh, That is absolutely correct. I would surmise I was in the um, top three worst public speakers in the wow. world in 2015. <laughs> <laughs> wow. Now, now I'm in the top 10 of the worst. No, I, I, I you know, no. So I knew that I actually would need to be a, a public speaker in order to do what I was intending to do. And so I uh, actually went through this Toastmasters training. I, I'm, I'm not at all, <clears throat> um, uh, I, I think it's great to share this because, you know, for all of our colleagues, it's it's really important the way that we present these things on stage. And the, one of the hardest things for us to do in nutrition, Casey, I believe, is is to tell it in a story. I still haven't been able to to master that, but but I'm working on that. So I, it, you know, I kind of try to break it down into into stories. Uh, a little bit, you know, in order to, for people to stay connected to it. But yeah, anyway, it's been, I, I had, I have to uh, rehearse uh, tremendously in order to walk onto a stage and even feel a, a remotely comfortable being able to, pr to present any of this. It's just, uh, it just takes, uh, for me, a lot of rehearsal. And well, you came a long way because you are masterful on stage and I completely agree with you. The way the message is told sometimes is really important and we need to engage people so that they'll listen and hear our message because it is so critical. I want to talk a little bit about your, um, really cool personal story, but before I do, um, I want to know, are you familiar with the TV show? Um, I don't think it's on anymore, but it's called how it's made. I've seen that a long time ago, I think. Uh, but anyway, tell me more. Well, or, so or... it's it's like one of those shows that like this is a bicycle, and here's how a bicycle's made, and it takes you through the steps and the process. And it's you know it's really chill. And I would sometimes like have it on, you know, while I was cooking dinner or something. And you know, this is how you make a basketball or whatever. And it it would just kind of show you a few things. And I just watched a video from there, and I'm gonna pretend like you were in the other room for the first minute, but you walk into the room and this episode of How It's Made shows these seeds and they're getting funneled into this giant machine where they're ground up and then they're further ground up and separated from the other crap that isn't the seeds. And then it's heated up to ultra hot temperatures and made into a paste, which is then cooked again in a chemical hexane and then it's purified for color and then it smells really bad. So they have to deodorize it and then it, pops up in this nice little golden bottle. Can you tell me what I'm possibly talking about here? <laughs> yes, uh, <laughs> you are talking about the production of 
seed oils, ding, vegetable ding, oils. Ding, ding. Got it. <laughs> yeah. Well, so we will call them, you know, generally seed oils uh, because that's really what they're primarily from. But but yeah, for the audience, um, um, Casey is talking about vegetable oils and that vegetable oils uh, is a euphemism. These don't come from vegetables. They come from seeds. And as Casey was explaining, um, these are produced in these, generally speaking, massive factories um, in, 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 to produce these oils that otherwise would never exist. And they go through these uh, this incredible complicated process. If you ever see, can see or see pictures of or watch the process Casey's talking about, um, the, the, these factories, they're very much like a petroleum factory and the seeds are, they're uh, crushed, heated, pressed. Um, they go through, uh, as Casey was mentioning, a hexane solvent bath, which is a petroleum derived product. So it's hexane. Then, they're, then they steam that to remove the hexane as much as they can, but they never remove it all. And it's a toxicant. And then this mush is chemically alkalinized, bleached, and deodorized. And th this, and then they finally have this uh, this product that that we think you know that people are told is is healthy to eat. And um, it is this disgusting. Is a, a, yeah, if anybody, uh, this is what I've I, and I have not personally actually not been to a vegetable oil uh, refin refinery, but um, the people that have say, say that if you go and watch this, and I've seen it in videos that as you have, but if you go and watch this, I'm told that almost nobody would ever think that it could even pot remotely be something healthier that we should be eating. Oh, it's disgusting. These as you're oils. watching it again, like if you're in the other room and you came in, you would you would look at this and go, oh, that's what they make my tires out of. Or, oh, that's like candle wax or something. Like, that's not, definitely not food. You need a hazmat suit or something. It's disgusting. <laughs> I, I could not agree more. It is, this is the most fantastically dangerous thing. And anybody who watched the process, if you take five minutes and watch the process, that they'll, they'll, they'll make it look as pretty as they can. Uh, you know these uh, vegetable oil manufacturers, but it is in it. It, it. This these are oils that really should belong in in machinery or what they what they once were used for. You know machinery oil or lamp oil. Um, you know lubrication those kind of things, but not to be consumed. Ugh, it's so gross. And they're proud of it too. Like it's, it's literally like whoever, whoever let them in the factory should be fired for sure. Because they're just like, yeah, this is made and it, canola oil is so good for you and healthy for you. And let's cholesterol. And just like, oh, it's so embarrassing. We'll definitely link to that in the notes. First, before we deep dive into canola oil, I want to know who, who you are, who, who is this dude, ophthalmologist, walks away from his career to make no money because he finds a, a passion of his that he's just dying to tell everybody. You started your foundation, you wrote your book. I, I understand you donate all of the money you make from the book. Like, tell us about yourself and how you got to be a doctor who's now interested in, in the harms of uh, vegetable oil. Well, um, so it's hard to know where to begin. So I am a medical doctor. Uh, I graduated from the U University of Colorado School of Medicine uh, back in 1990, went through a traditional uh, rotating internship at hospitals in Denver, and then a three-year ophthalmology residency. And I was just your just run-of-the-mill, average, ordinary um, uh, ophthalmologist in uh, practicing in Texas most of my career and, and uh, but for about 16 years, I was on the staff as an associate clinical professor at the University of Texas Southwestern Medical Center in Dallas. And Casey, my story really is, is, um, you know, uh, that it's very personal to, to me because two, two things. Number one is, is personally, I always wanted to be really healthy. I grew up as an athlete and 
um, was in three sports a year and just, I always wanted to be fit and healthy. And I, I began to really struggle with this when I was about 33 years old, I developed arthritis and this progressed markedly over the next 16 years. 33. Yeah, I was about 33, wow. 34 years old. And, um, and then by the time I was 50, most all of my major joints were involved with this arthritis. And I'd, I'd been to a whole bunch of uh, colleague, physician, friends, family practice, internal medicine, orthopedic surgeons, and even two rheumatologists. And eventually I was given a prescription in 2011 for an immunosuppressant, which I took for either one or two days. And I just so happened at that very same time to find out about the paleo diet. Now, I'm not really a paleo diet kind of guy, but I'm just telling you, this is just part of the story. So, so I changed my diet, went, went kind of went more paleo in 2011, and this dramatically improved my arthritis in eight days. I was like 80% better in eight or 10 days. And this is what, you know, began this journey for me because it was transformative. And, and so I wanted to just start learning more about nutrition. And I read Lauren Cordain's book, The Paleo, Paleo Answer. And from there, I began to understand that westernized diets, processed foods, which is basically just refined sugars, refined flours, seed oils, vegetable oils, and trans fats, that these things are associated with the development of all this chronic disease, heart disease, hypertension, strokes, cancer, type 2 diabetes, metabolic syndrome, overweight, obesity, Alzheimer's, dementia, these kinds of things. And so, so what I started to, in, so what, as I began to understand that, and I investigated that for a couple of years, Casey, it finally hit me that maybe processed foods might be driving macular degeneration. And I'm going to go, now let me go back in this story here because I had practiced ophthalmology. I mean, in private practice for 21 years at that point. And um, I had witnessed, you know, uh, probably, I mean, I don't know, probably thousands of patients. I'd seen thousands of patients with macular degeneration and I'd witnessed about three of them go blind in both eyes. Wow. And I'm telling you, when you see this, it becomes, you know, if this doesn't uh, tug at your heartstrings, then you're, you're as cold as a stone, because this is this is one of the most awful things to see. It is to witness somebody go blind. They can no longer see to read, to drive, to watch TV. They can't see their their kids or grand grandchildren's faces, things like that. Anyway, so um, so what happened was is in 2013. I, um, I had then came, I'd, uh, come across the work of Wesson Price, and I can talk about that more later. But anyway, uh, th so I developed a much, much, much deeper understanding of how man-made processed foods are driving all of this chronic disease, all those conditions I mentioned, all those diseases. And so it finally hit me, I, and, and trust me, I'm slow here. It's like it finally hit my thought, is it possible that these foods are driving macular degeneration? And over the years, I just kind of peripherally had noticed that my, that my patients that getting macular degeneration just in general weren't as healthy. You know, they just were more likely to be, you know, have these other conditions. And uh, so I began to investigate that. This was in 2013. And I spent about a year and a half investigating this the possibility that processed foods might be driving macular degeneration. And I worked on that for about a year and a half while I was still in practice. And I, and by February of 2015, I was so convinced that this hypothesis held water. I couldn't, I didn't have anything that you might consider solid proof, um, you know, which is, as you know, is very, 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 it's almost impossible to ever say that you have proof in medicine, but but anyway, I was so convinced that the hypothesis was valid and that it was uh, that could be scientifically validated that I left practice to pursue this full time, and um, so I worked on this just you know like a madman scientist for the next year and a half, and 
And I worked with uh, some other ophthalmologists and a, a nutrition researcher that helped me with all the data and the graphing and all that. But anyway, so we, we collated data of processed food consumption in 25 nations using sugar and vegetable oils as proxy markers for processed food consumption. And I tell you, they are extraordinarily good proxy markers. They're, in fact, they're the major components of processed food. And, uh, but anyway, the data strongly supported this hypothesis. And so this is, so anyway, I, so I, I wrote a book. Um, I went public with this in August of 2016 at the Ancestral Health Symposium, uh, which was held uh, in, uh, in, at the University of Colorado Boulder at that time. And then we eventually published a scientific paper in 2017 and then I've kind of been, you know, on the road and continuing the research and presenting publicly. And, and, and you know, I guess what happened was is I, I just, I saw so much evidence everywhere I looked that the seed oils, the vegetable oils were the primary culprit of all this chronic disease. Again, from heart disease to cancer, to dementia, to macular degeneration, to obesity. That And there were so few people that were, that really knew this well, uh, talking about it, I just felt compelled to go public with it. Um, and so I, I started doing that. And, um, I, and I'll just say right off the bat, the people that um, I was, I, I was aware of some of the researchers like, uh, like Kate Shanahan, Catherine Shanahan, Kate Shanahan, MD, who has been working on this for a couple of decades. And then eventually in 2019, I came across the work of uh, Tucker Goodrich, who has been working on this same thing for a decade, uh, seed oils. And incredibly, Tucker Goodrich and I have a very, very similar background. It's just it's strange how we both you know, uh, came to the same conclusions and, and uh, looked at a lot of the same things, because we both... Uh, went back to, you know, deeply into the history, the history of all this disease. And anyway, that's a long, long answer to that question. But I, but anyway, that's kind of the, my story and, and how I got to here. Wow. That is so super fascinating. I just love, there's so many guests that we bring on that they learn a thing and they're, they're just on fire about it and they can't keep it quiet anymore. They go out and they, they do work, they invest money, their own money, their own time. And it's just, it's so cool and inspiring to see that and to see that this, you know, topic grabbed you to such an extent that, I mean, you walked away from your practice and, you know, to go out and share this message and get good at public speaking, write your book. I just, I think it's so wonderful. So let's, let's dive in. Let's talk about the history of some of these diseases and in the context of when did some of these vegetable oils come online? And I, I'm so glad that you said, you know, we, we tend to think we hear vegetable oil. So great. This is like, I don't know, you got this from carrots and kale or something like that is absolutely yeah. not the case. <laughs> right. Okay. So let me, I'm going to preface this by saying this to the audience is that um, I think there is, I, I strongly believe, and, and I verify this every single day with the work that I've done now for a decade is that it all goes back to, you know, fundamentals, 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 right? This is what coaches tell you. This is what you tell your, your, your clients, right? Is you, every, everything, you always have to be grounded in the fundamentals. And the fundamentals of nutrition really are, um, you know, uh, in terms of bad nutrition really is, is lack, lack of nutrients and toxicity. So, so when, when foods are not nutrient dense and when they are toxic, you have a deadly duo that it's so, it all comes back to this. And let me just say that there are really are four main things that make up processed foods. As I mentioned, it's, and this is so fundamental and so simple, but it's really refined added sugars, refined flours, like, like white wheat flour, all the vegetable, all of the polyunsaturated vegetable oils, and then trans fats. And if you put those four things together, that is processed food. And when you consume those foods, you have two problems. Number one is they carry almost no nutrients at all. They have no fat-soluble vitamins, A, D, or K2. 
and these are incredibly important to our health. Um, they really have no significant minerals. And you have extraordinary toxicity, which we can get into, but the toxicity is coming mostly from these the, the vegetable oils and trans fats, not so much from sugar, but I, I'll say sugar in very high doses can become toxic. But if we go back, so you said, you know, you said history of these diseases. So in a nutshell, and I can dig into this a little, a little deeper, depending on what you, you know, how much time we have, but, but let me just tell you this heart disease in the 19th century, coronary heart disease was an extraordinary rarity. In fact, there was eight scientific papers on heart disease in the entire century, and they knew what it was. In fact, there was two cases, two of those papers that, that reviewed um, embolic uh, uh, myocardial infarction, which is the equivalent of heart attack. And in fact, in the famed physician, Sir William Osler, probably the most famous physician between the late 19th century and about maybe 1940, I think, um, he, uh, he, he published a paper in 1897. He'd reviewed his previous 21 years of hospital experience. This is an, uh, is an example of, of what's so incredible about that era. 21 years, he had never seen a heart attack. Wow. He witnessed about six cases of angina, the chest pain, um, um, consistent with coronary artery, artery type heart disease. And then in uh, that was 1897. And 13 years later in 1910, he was actually in, uh, now he was practicing in London, England, and he presented to an audience there. And he noted that in those 13 years, he had witnessed an additional 208 cases of angina. But uh, um, to the best of my ability to tell from his writings, uh, he had not witnessed a heart attack. Wow. And really almost nobody had. John Herrick, um, um, or maybe it was James Herrick, I can't remember, I think, but anyway, Herrick, 1912, published the first known myocardial infarction heart attack in the United States, uh, 1912. And yet by the 1930s, heart disease was the leading cause of death in the United States. So it really went from, like in 1905, nobody even knew what a heart attack was. It's really, almost no one had ever witnessed one. And by the 1930s was the leading cause of death. And of course, now today, heart disease kills about one out of every three people. It's wow. around 30, 32% or so. So cancer, for example, um, in the town of Boston in 1811, uh, cancer took the lives of five of 942 people that died. That's one in 188 people. All right, by 1900, cancer was killing one in 17 people in the United States. And today, in 2010, uh, cancer kills, I think it's 31.1% of people. So again, it's almost one in three. And you, it's a, the same situation, type, like type two diabetes. In fact, diabetes of any type was virtually unknown in the 19th century. Uh, I mean, it was an extraordinary rarity, right? And, and it was... 0.37% in 1935 diabetes. Um, it, this continued to rise. It was it rose two and a half fold by 1960, eight fold by 1990, 19 fold by 2010, and 25 fold by 2015. We were up to 9.4% by 2015. Today we're at 10 and a half percent though. So I think we're we're like around what whatever that is. It's something like almost 30 fold increase since 1935 and uh, obesity, 19th century, 1.2% uh, obesity in men age 18 to 80. Wow. You know, why, why 1.2%, you know, so, so by, so, you know, we think we were incredibly lean in 1960 when obesity in the United States was 13%. Well, it had risen 11 fold. And this trend continued 23% by 1988, 35.7%, I think it was by 2011, and 39.8% by 2015. We are on target to be 50% obesity in the United States in 2030, in about wow. nine years. 50% of all adults. Wow. So, so obesity, again, rose 30, has already risen 33 fold in about 115 years. 
Same situation with macular degeneration. It was an extraordinary medical rarity between 1851 and 1930. Um, by the 1970s, it was 8.8% um, of Americans over age 52, 27.9% of people over the age of 75. So again, almost one in three people over the age of 75 or 80. So, you know, all, that's what, and it's the same scenario, I won't try to go into it, but it's the same scenario with um, Alzheimer's disease and uh, probably Parkinson's and there's just so much other disease, you know, we could talk about that, you know, you, if you dig into the details, you start finding that these were all medical rarities, why? Well, at the same time, what happened was is, so back to the seed oils is, first of all, the world had no processed foods before the, uh, the American Civil War with the exception of sugar in small quantities. And so right after the American Civil War, manufacturers introduced seed oils into the food supply. And before that, seed oils were, the only one they had was in the United States or almost anywhere in the world was cotton seed. Well, it came out of the United States. No. Almost nobody in the world in 1865 had any form of vegetable oil, right? They're just, they did not exist. Um, and there was some tropical oils. There was olive oil in really small quantities. And there were some tropical oils like coconut oil in certain populations. But the world had never seen these vegetable oils, which are oils like cottonseed, uh, so soybean, corn, canola, cottonseed, rapeseed, grapeseed, sunflower, safflower, rice bran, sesame, and peanut oils. All those oils, the world had never seen them. Well, for the, I mean, 99.9% of well, the world. It's such a good point. And you mentioned Kate Shanahan, and, and she mentioned, like, if you take a coconut or an avocado and you squeeze it in your hand, you're going to get fat, like, oozing out between your fingers. How can you squeeze some of those things? You said, like, like cotton seed, that they're too small. Soybean, that's way too small. I don't even know what a canola is. So, like, how how do you even? You of course it wouldn't be in the diet because you couldn't get any out of it. Yeah, well, and that's the thing. So, I mean, and that's really where it began. You know, it began with, you know, they they were they had taken cotton seeds, which were a waste product, and um, they had made uh, they started making. Um, lamp oil and machine oil out of that. And then eventually they made fertilizer out of it. And then they, then they started putting it into feed for cattle and it didn't kill cattle. And so then they decided to feed it to people, which began in 1866. And, but they didn't want the people to know. And so what they did was they started, this was the, as far as I, I mean, this is the first big, you know, uh, uh, um, adulteration of food with this, because, so they started putting it in um, lard and in uh, butter is what they did. And they put it in olive oil, in fact. So we were shipping, um, I, I don't remember the number, Casey, but it was like hundreds of thousands of barrels of olive oil to the to Europe, and I think it was the French that made complaint back to the United States in 1880 because they knew that that was not olive oil. So there's only two places to produce olives at the time, and it was in Italy and in California, in the whole world. That's where olive oil came from. And mm. so they, they knew what olive oil tasted like. People today, they don't even know what a, uh, a normal olive oil is supposed to taste like most of them because they've never had it. it it's all wow. being adulterated. 80% of it's adulterated with these cheap vegetable oils. But anyway, so what happened was, is so they began to put cottonseed oil in the food supply. They adulterated butter and lard and then eventually... Event, so we had cottonseed first, and then in 1909, we got soybean. And if we back up just a bit, in 1900, Valerius Anderson produced, he invented the, the, the expeller press. And the expeller press was an automated device to do exactly what you're talking about, and that's to take seeds, which could never produce oils, and crush them so severely that they could squeeze this little bit of oil out of it. And then they started figuring out how to, you know, with this, with, you know, deeper manufacturing, how to treat it with, uh, with all these other processes, you know, the heating and crushing and steaming and, and 
um, you know, bleaching and alkalinization and all that deodorization in order to try to make this product that looked good because it had to look good um, in order to be for them to put it in the food supply and people not think it was something like petroleum. And uh, but anyway, so they eventually they started putting it into um, uh, they made well they well in 1909 they made they started making uh, uh, Crisco. So Procter and Gamble made Crisco, which is hydrogenated seed oil and uh, so that was meant to kind of look like lard and again this is another way they then they convinced the the world that this was a good substitute for butter and lard and that was their whole goal was to outsell undersell butter and lard and that's exactly what they did so let me give you some numbers so in 1865 the world had zero vegetable oils and the linoleic acid the omega-6 consumption in, in 1865 was about 2.2 grams per day, at least uh, coming from a 40% animal fat diet. So I think that's a pretty good estimate. It was about one, less than 1% 1 of our total calories in 1865. By 1909, we had cottonseed oil and soybean oil and omega-6 linoleic acid LA consumption was 4.84 grams a day. So it was already more than double. We're about 2% of calories by that point. Well, then fast forward to 1999, Americans are consuming 18 grams a day of, of omega-6 linoleic acid or 7% of their calories. And by 2008, 29 grams a day or 11.8% of their calories, just round it off. It's about 12% of calories coming from omega-6 linoleic acid alone. And what we need is, is what I found is that all of these native traditional populations and their diets, they're getting less than 2% of their fat as omega-6 linoleic acid. Because the only way to get omega-6 in high levels is through seed oils, uh, for the most part, seed oils uh, and nuts and seeds. Mm. That's Again, big picture, that's where all this omega-6 is coming from. So again, we increased our consumption of these oils, uh, these uh, uh, just omega-6 linoleic acid alone in 145 years. We increased it 12-fold, and that was 2008. So we're at 2021. I don't even know where we are today because the World Health Organization stopped tracking all this in about 2010 or 11. I don't think they really, I don't even know if they want us to know anymore. Wow. But what's happened is, is you know, the... The whole world now is supplanting and replacing their animal fats, lard, butter, and beef tallow, with seed oils. That's what's happened everywhere. And everywhere these seed oils go, there is a trail of massive destruction. And that massive destruction begins with metabolic disease. So very rapidly, metabolic syndrome. It'll happen in days on, with high seed oil diet. And then, you, and then type 2 diabetes, which comes, can come on in months. And then, uh, you know, and then obesity, cancers, and then eventually heart disease, strokes, um, hypertension, you know, high blood pressure, um, uh, dementia, Alzheimer's, and macular degeneration. And, you know, people have to realize that it, for a lot of these diseases, these so-called chronic diseases, like, you know, for example, Alzheimer's and heart attacks and and a lot of cancers and macular degeneration, it takes decades of exposure generally for people to develop these conditions. So there's an incubation period. If you think about it, like, you know, the incubation period for, for uh, when you're, is when you're, ex when you're exposed to something and the time it takes to get the, con the, the, the disease condition. And for example, a cold virus, if, if you're exposed to it, maybe in three or four days later, you could come down with the cold if you're going to get it. But with processed foods and with seed oils, the exposure for a lot of these conditions is decades of time. That's right. And so you, th this is why it becomes so incredibly difficult to prove this in any scientific study, because, like in controlled trials, because you, you can't control what people are eating. And if you can, you can't do it for very long. <laughs> yeah, that's a really <laughs> good point. That's a really good point. Okay, so you, maybe this is a good time to answer this. You just mentioned butter and lard and coconut oil and polyunsaturated vegetable oils 
I look at those, those are all fat. So, so what? Like they're just fats, right? Or is there, what's the difference between those types of fats? To me, this is by far, by far and away, the most important thing to know of all is, is about the fat consumption. And this is what, this is play, this plagues me every day of my life for the last nine years is that when I look at studies, Casey, uh, and they're just, they're just tens of thousands of them, fat is, is considered all the same. So in these study after study after study, it's like high fat diet, high fat diet, high fat diet, or low fat diet or whatever, but they're not breaking the fats down into their, the, the different types of fat wow. and where the fat comes from is just the most important thing of all. Wow. Uh, you know, w- one is the vegetable oils are poison and the others, the traditional animal fats that come from traditionally raised animals, you know, like cattle, uh, chickens, pork, when they're raised traditionally, those fats are incredibly different, but let's go, let's go back here. So a healthy animal, really the, the, the primary fats in those animals, number one is monounsaturated fat. And then the second one is saturated fat. And monounsaturated fats are like the primary one that people would have heard of is oleic acid. And that is the monounsaturated fat that is so prominent in olive oil. And so, and that is a healthy uh, fat. And then you have saturated fats. And again, those are very, very common in animal fats. So like a, a steak um, a good, from a, gr- a good grass fed, hundred percent grass fed animal, that steak is going to be like 40 to, you know, 48% saturated somewhere in that range. And, um, and there, and then also saturated fats are very heavy and they're, they're, they're the most common in the tropical oils. So that'd be coconut palm and palm kernel oils, for example. And then, so then you have polyunsaturated fats and these are the ones that um, are they're in they're in very high amounts in seed oils, nuts, nut oils, and then um, in, in and in fish. But in fish, it would be omega three primarily, and not omega six. So if we if we look at let me just get, go back here and say what so what we want to be consuming is is we want to be consuming very very high amounts of saturated and monounsaturated fats. And we want our polyunsaturated fats, the omega-6 and omega-3, to be extremely low. And how do we do that? And we do that by, really, by eliminating all the oils, in my uh, uh, opinion, except for, you know, maybe the tropical oils and possibly olive oil. We can talk about that. But anyway, the, the tropical oils, and I think the safest one is probably coconut oil. But, um, but anyway, if you consume... But for example, let me talk about just really briefly. So beef, for example, raised on grass, 100% grass fed pastured beef, the the omega-6 linoleic acid in that animal is about 0.5 or 0.6% typically, something Mm. like that. All right. And in pasture raised chicken and pork, it is the omega-6 linoleic acid is about 2%. Okay, now compare that to the linoleic acid in most of your seed oils, which is about 20% to 75%. Wow. Like the most common one is in the United States is uh, soybean oil. And so it's soybean and canola. And soybean oil is about 56% polyunsaturated fat. So you see, or I mean, I'm sorry, 56% polyunsaturated omega-6 linoleic acid, just that one. And so 56% versus animal fats that are 0.6 to 2% in properly raised animals. Now, if those animals are improperly raised, the beef will still be low. And we can talk about why that is if you want, but the beef will still be very low in linoleic acid, but the chicken the monogastric type animals like chicken and pork, which are like more like us, they're omnivores. And they are going to have a much higher level of omega-6 linoleic acid in their fat. And so they become less healthy when they're fed 
uh, in CAFOs, in concentrated animal feeding operations, where they're fed GMO corn and soy, and their omega-6 in their fat will go up. But they will never, none of, no, none of the, the worst raised animals would be fantastically healthier than most all, all of these seed oils. Wow. And you're mentioning nuts and seeds, and I'm just thinking functionally for the plant. The plant wants the the you know they want to continue to live and grow and expand just like we do. They want to take over the world. And so when you're talking about nuts and seeds and polyunsaturated oils, it, it isn't the function of the oil for the plant to help protect it and give it nutrients for the plant as it's protecting the seed. And if so, it it would make perfect sense that that would not be a really great thing to consume if the plant wants to protect its most sacred parts. We can consume any kinds of uh, plants. Uh, so consuming a plant of, of any sort, any vegetable or fruit will never uh, hurt us in terms of the omega-6 consumption. You, I just don't think you can really get there mm. it, for the most part. Gotcha. You know, in other words, if you're eating avocados and olives, for example, and then all, all the vegetables and fruits, you're never going to, you know, A, your linoleic acid consumption, your omega-6 is going to be low. And B, you won't be consuming the oxidized components because they're still in the plant in their native traditional form. Um, so, you know, when you put, when you, you know, Kate Shanahan says, nature doesn't make bad fats, factories do. Mm, and yeah, that is that. a pretty powerful statement. I like that statement. I've used that before which I always credit Kate for because I learned it from her maybe five, six, seven years ago. And, you know, that's a good way to think of it because I think, you know, in general that, you know, plants can be consumed healthfully by most people. Yeah, that's great. Um, I just meant like the seed itself being too concentrated with that, that oil that's not, you know, maybe even do evenly distributed through the plant that maybe some forms of plants are, you know, better than others. But you mentioned oxidation, and that is something that is super, super important. I, I want to make sure we cover that. When I think of oxidation, I think of things like rust or aging. Yeah. How do you think of oxidation and what's going on there? Rather than getting deep into the chemistry, which I'll, I'll, I'll sort of hit on that, but what people need to understand is that the unsaturated fats, again, the, the omega-6 and omega-3, but far more likely the omega-6, these, these are the fats that undergo oxidation. And in the fat, we call that peroxidation. And when we consume these fats, to excess these um, omega-6 fats, they accumulate in our fat and they accumulate in a huge way. So for example, um, I'm not finding, overall, if you look at the very, very few, we only have a, just two or three studies of, of uh, populations consuming native traditional diets and the omega-6 linoleic acid in their fat is around um, three to 4% in that range. And today, you know, so the omega-6 fat in um, Americans was 9.5% um, uh, 9, 9 in uh, 1961 on average, and it rose to 21.5% by 2008. 21.5%. Mm. It should be down around 3 or 4%. Mm. But what happens is so our body is meant to... To, we're meant to consume very, very tiny amounts of omega-3 and omega-6 fat. And those fats are meant to be very, very specific places. Like for example, omega-6 is important in our mitochondrial membranes um, where we make energy, but we're supposed to have these in tiny amounts. And um, so our body's not meant to naturally burn these for fuel. So they accumulate in our fat and in our, in our cell membranes and in our mitochondrial membranes, and they undergo oxidation. And so oxidation really is when, so our body makes hydroxyl radicals and everybody's heard of radicals. And what these do is these pull an electron from an unsaturated fat. They can't do this really to a saturated fat or to a monounsaturated fat. It just, because they don't have all these double bonds. And, but the, but anyway, so, so when, um, so when these unsaturated fats react with oxygen, they form what's called a peroxyl radical. And this peroxyl radical then reacts with the 
unsaturated fat sitting right next to it. And it creates this vicious cycle of oxidation. And so you're, you're, so it's almost like you're setting yourself on fire, right? It starts with this little tiny one molecule. And then in one second, a thousand molecules of your omega-6 fat now have oxidized. And so this is a propagation kind of reaction. And, and so uh, what this does is this ultimately, it damages this molecule called cardiolipin, which sits inside of our mitochondrial membranes and the inner mitochondrial membranes. And it's the linchpin upon which the electron transport chain functions. And that, that electron transport chain depends on what's called a proton gradient, a hydrogen proton gradient. Well, when you consume too many omega-6 fats and your cardiolipin then breaks down, that, that inner mitochondrial membrane becomes leaky and it leaks these protons across the membrane and you use your, lose your power source. So the protons then can no longer be properly utilized to convert ADP, adenosine diphosphate, to ATP, adenosine triphosphate, which is the energy currency of the cell. So we lose energy. And when your cell loses energy, you just think that the cell is the microcosm of the body. So the cell loses energy and now you start losing energy. And, you know, then all, you know, uh, everything goes haywire when the cell is losing energy. So um, this is when you start getting, the cell becomes insulin resistant. The cell produces more uh, free radicals. The cell then, cannot carry out proper functions like proper cell division, mutations occur then. So this leads to cancers. Um, the, the, the cellular loss of energy leads to uh, you know, all sorts of destructive mechanisms within the cell that leads to neurodegeneration. The lack of energy leads to, in general, things like congestive heart failure, fatigue, and the other thing is, is that the cell can no longer properly burn fat for fuel because you've severely damaged the one place where fat burns in the, in the cell, and that's in the mitochondria. And so what happens is your cell just begins to store the fat. And this is how we become overweight and obese. This is the primary mechanism, I'm convinced. Now, there's other mechanisms. I'm not saying this is the only way, but this is a massive way that leads to all this disease. So, you know, when physicians say, you know, that, well, obesity leads to heart disease and to cancers and to diabetes, I don't think of it that way at all. Obesity is not the cause of those diseases. It runs with them because they're all caused by the same thing. Yep. And the same thing is a processed food laden diet and a processed food laden diet worldwide now is replete with seed oils that's the primary component wow. so in other words like and i'm going to go back just one more statistic here so we were zero percent seed oils in 1865 and by uh 2010 in the united states about 32 percent of the uh of the united states consumption was coming from seed oils 32 percent the lowest figure you'll get which is actual consumption is 24%. That comes from our own uh, uh, USDA. Wow. So, so uh, at least a fourth, if not a third, and for a lot of people, more than that, they're eating a lot of processed food. They're eating more than a third of their diet in these seed oils. And again, so these seed oils have replaced the traditional animal fats. And everywhere I look, you just see this, it's the same trail of destruction. Wow. You follow this, this, you follow the breadcrumbs and it's just not hard to put these dots together. Once you, you know, if you just, you know, just keep digging and digging, digging, you know, like some of us have, uh, because we're nerds, you know, and you just go down the same path and you just keep finding the same thing. It always comes back to this. And if you look at these studies and these researchers and they say, well, you know, we have this, whatever bad outcome, congestive heart failure on this high fat diet. What was the high fat diet? Guess what it always is. It's always seed oil induced. <laughs> wow. It's the same thing. They'll, you'll never find where they put them on 100% butter um, or 100%, you know, or a little bit of butter and some lard. You never find that. You just don't hardly ever find that. It just doesn't hardly exist. I mean, that, that when they add fat to the diet, it's usually in the form, most of it is in the form of seed oils. Wow. And for the listener, like 
you may be thinking like, okay, I'm going to clean out my cupboard. I'm going to get rid of any vegetable oils. I'm going to replace them with some of those saturated fats that you mentioned. Those are more heat stable. They oxidize less. That's why they're solid at room temperature. That's a really good way that you can tell and that you can go, you know, take your whole paycheck and go to Whole Foods and buy anything they have off the shelf and assume that that's healthy, but it's not. It's everywhere, everywhere, every product, every salad dressing, everything that's marketed to you as being healthy is full of this crap. It's insane. It's exact. That is exactly right. Whole, so even, and I shop at Whole Foods, we shop at Whole Foods. So, but Whole Foods, you're going to find seed oils in a lot of the processed foods. Now you definitely will be able to find more things that have good, a good oil, like coconut oil or palm kernel oil. Um, but in general, you're in, in processed foods. So chips and crackers and, you know, already prepared foods, they're almost all going to have, going to have seed oils in them. And, and yeah, so you can buy dangerous food at Whole Foods. Uh, no, no question. Wow. That's, that's, the, that's the fat of choice in restaurants. It is almost ex in this country. It's almost exclusively uh, soybean and canola, and they're both dreadful, just absolutely dreadful. Wow. All right. Well, Dr. Chris Kenobi, being who you are, you're 60 years old, which I don't know what you did. I, I figure you went into a cryo chamber for 20 years and they just like automatically played podcasts into your brain so that you could stay sharp, but not age at all. Um, <laughs> you're going around, you're sharing your message. You've got tons of passion and energy. It's great. Being who you are, knowing what you know, what are some of the things that make it onto your plate during an average day? Well, first of all, you're way too kind. I'm pretty sure I look pretty close to my age. <laughs> Not at all. <laughs> I am, I'm trying. Anyway, thank you for the, the, the way too kind words. I'll tell you what. You, uh, you look like a 60-year-old who comes on to our show. And, you know, Dr. Kukazel is 50. But, um, you know, all of these guests we had, like Brad Kearns, he's 55. Uh, Sean Baker is 55 or 56. Like, and everybody's thriving and kicking ass and, and doing it. So you look like a 60-year-old in this world. Let's say that. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you. Um, so I, I eat pretty normal foods. I think I eat, you know, if I could sum it up in a sentence, I'd say I eat a lot like a 19th century American. I eat a lot of beef. It's all 100% grass raised, 100% gra pastured grass raised. Mo so I eat mostly beef and in terms of, you know, meats, uh, mostly beef and wild caught fish. And then I eat smaller amounts of chicken. So maybe 10, 15% of my uh, meat would be chicken. And those are also pastured. So I get that. I get those from Grassroots uh, Farmers Cooperative. So I order those in. And then I eat a variety of uh, fruits and vegetables. I'm not low carb at all. Um, I'm not, I don't try to go low fat or low carb. I'm kind of in probably in the middle range. Um, and let's see, so I use a lot of butter, everything cooked in butter, everything. I, I don't cook anything in any other oil besides butter. So if it needs an oil, it's gonna be butter. Love it. Um, yeah. So, and I eat, you know, quite a fair amount of fruit. Um, I eat, uh, uh, potatoes, rice, everything's organic. Um, certainly do that. And I eat a fair amount of eggs. Uh, uh, last year I was consuming a lot of raw milk. Um, I actually have quit for a while because I found out that I am, even with all this, I'm iron deficient. And probably this is a, this is another long story, but um, uh, almost half of the world is three billion people in the world are iron deficient, and I am one of them. Finally, found out with the help of a colleague, uh, and so um, I'm working on that. But anyway, so I, I quit da dairy, but I think raw dairy is a fantastic uh, uh, food. Come, you know, again, this is from uh, cattle raised 100% uh, on organic, uh, you know, grass fields. Um, so. Um, I do, I don't, I try to avoid supplements with the exception of, so I don't take any vitamin supplements, but I do take um, uh, magnesium and I take, uh, and I add a fair amount of uh, just mineral salts. So I add that to my diet. That's great. That all sounds. I, 
I guess that's the best way to summarize it. Yeah, that all sounds really great. I love that you are able to ride the line and you don't get too far into the low carb or low fat world. You're you're focusing on, you know, some of those low hanging fruit that, you know, get get the processed crap out of the diet and settle into whatever foods you like and especially if they're local to you and you will probably be just fine. I think that's wonderful. I think it's great advice. I think that's really approachable. What is one thing you would like to leave the listener with today? The one thing would be to focus on the big picture and keep it simple that try, you know, try to eliminate processed food. So remember if it has added sugars, refined flours, any kind of vegetable oil or trans fat, don't eat it. Focus on traditional uh, foods, meats, eggs, fish, all from in their, you know, if you can afford it in their naturally raised ways and then organic fruits and vegetables. Um, it's just, it's so simple. You can make any kind of food in the world. You can make donuts healthy if you make them the right way. You know, I mean, I, and I'm not promoting donuts, okay? But what I'm saying is, is if you like Mexican food or Chinese or, you know, Japanese or French, whatever, doesn't matter what it is, make it with ancestral ingredients like we're talking about and leave out the processed foods, those four big things. And you're, you're, you know, you fixed 97% of your problems right there. I love that. That is such great advice. Listen, this has been such an amazing conversation, Dr. Chris Kenobi. Um, we, I mean, we barely scratched the surface into AMD and eyesight, and we would just be thrilled if you had some time to come back on another day that we can talk about that and deep dive there, because I think there's a lot to unpack that would be really helpful for people. Um, so yeah, we would love to have you back on to discuss that. I would just love to do that, Casey, because that that's where I feel like that's a big part of my calling. And I, I, my heart is with those people and I want to prevent that as much as possible. That's awesome. We love that. Tell us where people can go to find your work. Well, so you can find me, um, I, you know, we're not very well organized about this, but you can find a lot of my presentations on YouTube and you can find me specifically and some of my work and presentations on uh, Cure at Cure AMD Foundation, at, which is cureamd.org. We're a 501c3 nonprofit organization. And our goal is just to reach people with this message, Casey. Well, That's you're, it. you're doing a tremendous job and appearing here with us today is a big part of that. Dr. Chris Kenobi, uh, author of Ancestral Dietary Standard to Prevent and Treat Macular Degeneration. What an honor, what a great discussion. Um, really learned a lot and always just enjoy your energy and passion. And thank you so very much for taking the time to come and talk with us today. We really appreciate it. Thank you, Casey. It's been an honor and a pleasure myself. Awesome. I, I really appreciate it. That's great, we've loved it. And this has been another episode of Boundless Body Radio.